Beautiful, beautiful voice. Thank you so much, Johanna. Let us pray. We are seeking, Lord, to find that courage that Pastor Warfield talked about this morning, the courage to risk, to gamble, even all that we might serve thee. Grant now, as we take another look at this subject, this theme, you will speak to us in Christ's name. Amen. I want to commend again those who took part last week in service, Sabbath. I would remind you, though, that in the Adventist church I grew up in, every Sabbath was service Sabbath. We would get on the streetcar in Cincinnati, Ohio, at 6 in the morning, Warfield, ride 12 miles downtown to the Shiloh Seventh-day Adventist Church. We stayed all day. Anybody remember when Adventists stayed in church all day? You brought your lunch. And then after service, having eaten, you went out into the community every Sabbath. So just a tip to you. The service Sabbaths are just tuning you up to go back to old-fashioned Seventh-day Adventism. I knew your amens would be pitiful and pathetic. <laughs> but I will help you. Amen. Amen! Joy cometh in the morning. <laughs> I want to begin with us reading a text together. Help me out, brethren. Can you see it? And if you can't, it's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We're reading together, everybody. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. Read it now. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Let's shift now to the Message Bible version of that passage. Makes it a bit more clear. Let's read. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. Number one, number one, number one, the Bible says, don't come talking like you're going through something nobody else has. I was just forget that. You not so special that God must invent special trials for you. Hate to do that to you. So whatever you're going through, somebody else has already gone through. Let's finish. Let's finish. All you need to remember, yes, sir, come on, somebody, is that God will never let you down. Let's just pause and say amen. Why don't you say amen again? Amen. First of all, he says, now, don't, 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 don't come with this. Oh, Lord, ain't nobody been through right. No, don't, I don't want to hear that. Once you're going through the common trial, then the next point is that God will not do what? Yeah. Let you down. Hey. All right. Now, now, this next phrase is really delicious. Come on. He'll never, I want everybody reading, He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. Now, the reason why your amens were weak, because you don't believe that. You don't believe that. Some of you sitting here right now actually think that God has put you through something that's beyond what you can bear. And you said it. Lord. 
There's more than I can handle. Come on, y'all. Somebody get honest. You know you said it. But the text says, the text says, that's not true. I just read the text. It said, God will not push you where? Beyond your limit. Beyond your limit. Beyond your limit. That means if the problem is there, it's your size. I'm just reading the Bible, y'all. Just reading the Bible. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and then the last phrase, heal what? Everybody's reading. He'll always be there to help you come through it. Now what I read into this text is that God is building a people. He's building me. And he's doing so by constantly challenging us to expand beyond our faith and spiritual capacity. This is why, this is why, Sanjay Thomas, that the trials always get worse. Because he's building spiritual muscles. And if you want to be able to lift more weight, you got to take on more weight. Can I get a witness? The Charleston Nine taught us the realities of living a Christian life. We can be innocent targets of Satan's wrath. We learned last week as I presented in the first service about John the Apostle that, that following Christ can cost us our own priorities and life plans and bring us to live and prosper under God's agenda for our lives. In other words, one of the risks that you take when you follow Christ is that he will rearrange all the things you had in mind. Nothing will go the way you planned it. And then from Adam last week, we learned that being a follower of God means we cease to take selfish risks for selfish wants. Because we found out the price is too high. But we found out last week, my, 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 that because we're so stubborn and continually make those kinds of selfish risk decisions, Jesus came. Somebody say Jesus came. Jesus, Jesus came. Jesus came and put all he was and had on the line to bring us back to our senses. Let the church say amen. amen. And so our theme for this quarter is risking to serve. Now listen. Every sermon should have a theme statement. Here comes the theme statement. Today we learn God can ask of us a great deal. But in his asking, here's the theme of the sermon. In his asking is a hidden test, and this is it. You have to trust that God never asked you too much. You got cancer? God's fair. You lost your house during the housing crisis. You couldn't make up the payments. God's fair. You lost your job over the Sabbath. God's fair. Her child had the fever and stayed alive. Your child had the fever and died. But God is not putting more on you than you can bear. He sees you as a person who can suffer the loss of a child and keep on trusting. So the theme today is, we're going to talk about Noah, the theme today is there are trials but you have to believe, you have to believe that when the trial comes, God 
in the midst of the trial is not asking too much of you. In fact, you have to believe that if he permits it, he has already supplied you with the strength to endure it. Somebody needs to say amen out there. You can't even imagine Noah's world. Even after sin, the world remained a beautiful place, unspoiled. Even race in the time of Noah probably didn't have 10 million inhabitants on the entire planet. That's about the population of New York City. There was a lot more land service because there were no big oceans. In fact, it seems that most people in Noah's day lived near seas of the Middle East. We know this because most oil is found in the Middle East and oil is decomposed biological matter. We must also keep in mind that there are four rivers that flowed out of the Garden of Eden and two of them still exist, the Tigris and Euphrates. That's in the Middle East. So more than likely in Noah's day, 90% of the earth wasn't even populated. There were no huge metropolitan areas, no high bare mountains. The world was just like God described it in Genesis 1.31. Go there quickly, I can't wait on you. When God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. How good was it? How good was it? So that's the world. Of Noah's day. Here's how Ellen White describes it. Brethren, put that up there. Ellen White describes this world this way. Come on. The hills were crowned with majestic trees, supporting the fruit laden branches of the vine. The vast garden like plains were clothed with verdure and sweet with the fragrance of a thousand flowers. I like the way that old lady writes. Come on. Patriarch and Prophets. The fruits, come on. The fruits of the earth were in great variety and almost without limit. The trees far surpassed in size, beauty, and perfect proportion. Any now to be found, she's writing about that world before the flood. Their wood was a fine grain and hard substance, closely resembling stone. The, the, the wood of trees in Noah's day was like stone. And can you imagine them building the ark with this kind of stuff? But see, these were, these were big fellows, great big folks. Ellen White says more than twice our size, so, so uh, 12, 13, 14 feet were these people building the ark back in those days. And then she says, uh, 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 and, and, and hardly less enduring, gold, silver, and precious stones existed in abundance. This was the world of Noah's day. But in contrast, I'm teaching you now, you teach before you preach. In contrast to the topographical beauty of the earth and the world before the flood, was the moral decay. The world was as bad morally as it was beautiful topographically. Wow. Read, come on, Genesis 6. Genesis 6. Look at this, look at this. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man, verse 5, Genesis 6, verse 5, when the, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was what? They just thought bad all the time. Now these are people that lived a hundred, hundreds of years. You know, how, how much sin can you commit in 600 years? These are bad people. We are, we're, we're, we're just, you know, we, we, we think we're sinners. We're just, we're, we don't, these were sinners. So when you, when you practice sin for 200 years, you know how to sin, come on now. Yeah, you, get, you get good at sin. You become a sin expert. And the Bible says they reached the point where these great minds, these, these minds, these huge brains thought of nothing but evil continually. It's in the Word. We just read it. Verse 11. Verse 11. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with what? Violence. Violence. So in the context of this terrible situation, Noah was asked to take a risk to serve. It would test everything in human terms of his relationship to God, whom he trusted. 
Noah would wrestle with the single thought, has God put on me more than I can handle? In this context of natural beauty and ugliness, God singles out one man, Noah. His father named him in Genesis 5, 29. His name means to rest or comfort. God's got a funny sense of humor. Genesis 6, starting in verse 13, describes the assignment. Now, since the young man did such a good job reading those verses, I won't read them, but I'm going to sum them up for you. Number one, verse 13 and 17, I'm going to destroy all flesh. Number two, build a boat, but not an ordinary boat, an ark-like boat boat. Number three, build it a certain way. Build it a certain way. If you want to be saved, you've got to do exactly what God says. Come on, somebody. Yeah, build it a certain way. Number four, I'm going to send a flood. Number five, the ark is for you, your wife, your sons, and daughters-in-law. Come back to that, verse 18. Verses 19 and 20, save in the ark various creatures. Number seven, bring food on the ark for yourself and beasts. And then verse 22, look at verse 22. Thus Noah did. How did he do it? How did he do it? Come on, y'all. According to what? Noah, listen, Noah is expected to do what he was told, even though what he was told seems to defy Noah's capacities. See, God asked the church to live a righteous life, doesn't he? Why are y'all getting quiet, doesn't he? But the Bible says all have sinned. You're asking me to do something, Lord, beyond my capacity. The Bible says, be holy, even as the Lord thy God, Jeff, am holy. And then the Bible says, but there is none good, no, not one. You're asking me to be and do something beyond my capacity. See, the thing I want to teach you first in the sermon is being a Christian has always been beyond your capacity. The only thing that makes it possible is the power of God, Noah. You can't build an ark by yourself, Noah. You need God to build the building. Now, how many issues does Noah face? I'm going to go right back down through the passage. First, <laughs> Noah is told all flesh will be destroyed. Now, excuse me, God. If you're going to wipe everything out, then why am I preaching? You follow? I want you to see Noah's issues. See, Warfield, you and I face a dilemma, you and me and Jeff. We've been called to preach the gospel, but we know everybody we preach to is not going to be saved. Ah, huh? come on now. But God says, in spite of that right, give it all you got. Hey, preach with fervor. Read the text. Preach as if you believe everyone will be saved. I'll make the decisions. You do the preaching. The job of the church is to do what God says. We're not to decide who will be saved, who will not be saved. Just do what God says. Amen. 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 He'll save whom he can save. Too many of us are trying to do God's work for him. She wears jewelry. She's been a prostitute. Her pants are too tight. She can't be saved. 
Where'd you read that text? Give me that text. Where is that text? I want to find that text. I ain't seen it nowhere. Ah, but her dresses are long. She, she wears, she drinks carrot juice and, 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 and surely, surely she's going in, is she? She might be so proud of her righteousness she can't be saved. Don't you worry, Noah, about who will and who. You just do build the ark. Amen. Our job is ark building. God's job is saving people. Yes. Second, he's told to build an ark, a huge boat. Now, I don't believe that Noah was unfamiliar with the idea of a boat. I mean, they had no oceans, but they had seas. Genesis 1.10. So they, 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 they've seen boats, and surely... People of that intelligence of that day knew how to build a boat, but this was an ark, a floating house of huge dimensions. And remember, a cubit is the distance between the tip of a man's finger, index finger, and an elbow. But if you're 14 feet tall, then a cubit is longer than 18 inches. That ark was humongous. Great, big vehicle. He was to build it on dry land. No concern, Noah. It's going to be a flood. Now, Noah, nor anyone else in history since Adam, had ever seen anything that was a flood. Is anybody listening to this sermon? See, I imagine in the original conversation, when God said flood, Noah said, what? I'm bringing a flood. You're bringing a what? Lots of water. <laughs> all he ever seen was mist covering the ground in the morning. Read Genesis 2 and verse 5. That's all they, that's all they have, just a little, little mist. So he's, listen, folk, I, I, you need to listen to this sermon. God is asking Noah to do something he can't even understand. And then he's got to tell, what are you doing, Noah? Building a boat, an ark. For what? A flood. A what? <laughs> the third challenge that Noah faced makes the other two seem like nothing. Let's do some Bible math. Genesis 7, 6 and 11 says the flood came when Noah was 600 years old. Right? Genesis 6, 3 says that they had 120 years from the time that God called Noah. Are you with me so far? Which means that Noah was 480 when he started preaching. How are we doing so far? At 480, he starts the seventh day Ark Ventist Church. Genesis 5 and verse 32. I enjoyed putting that in the sermon. Y'all just give, 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 the, give the pastor a few kudos. Yeah, just, I mean, that took a little mental effort. Yeah. yeah. Don't quote that, Warfield. That's mine. <laughs> Art Venice Church. Now, 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 but now we, we, we got to get to the man. According to Genesis 5 32, Noah had no children till he was 500. And Genesis 11.10 says that Shem, the oldest son, was only a hundred two years after the flood. Thus, the major test for the faith of Noah was that he had to believe, and Mrs. Noah had to believe, that children they did not have would marry, would marry women not yet born and be saved from a flood that had never happened. Wow. Let me make it plain, I'll say, he preached 20 years without no kids. Come on, somebody stay awake in this sermon.
And in those first 20 years, he's preaching, Fabian. Preaching, hey, the Lord is going to save me and my wife and my kids. And his neighbors are saying, what? Kids? He ain't got no kids? This man is crazy. And you can believe that the Lord didn't say, at 500, you're going to have a child. He had to operate in faith, America, for 20 years. You, hey, the just shall live by faith. That's how we live. Christians are always doing stuff we can't understand and can't explain, but we just say, God said do it. So we do it. I need a witness out there. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it. First year preaching, second year preaching. And he's, and he, uh, Mrs. Noy, any? Anything happening yet? No, not, not this month. <laughs> oh, everything, everything's like it's been. Are y'all listening to me? Well, well, well honey, you know, it's, 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 the Lord said, well, I don't know, but we, but they, 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 not, not happening. They're, they're, they're. Do you get it? Wow. He's building their faith. He's building your, he said, I will come again. Come on, somebody. And he said, if I said it, I'm going to do it. Therefore, he said, cast not away, therefore, your confidence. He that shall come will come and will not tarry. But for 20 years on Noah, he tarried. you got to believe that God keeps his word, not on your schedule, but on his schedule. Then number four, they were to believe they could gather up all these animals. God didn't say how. Have you seen some of those ancient animals? And then fifth, they had to come up with a plan to grow enough for all these animals and themselves. They don't know how many animals. They don't know how many people. Sons, he didn't even say how many sons. How are you going to gather food? For sons you ain't got. And finally, we don't have to discuss. We don't have time to discuss the, the, the getting the materials for the ark, the, the paying for them, hiring labor if they got no volunteers, and above all, convincing leaders, family, neighbors, friends, and people in general that they were not absolutely insane. Has it ever occurred to you just how bizarre the Seventh-day Adventist faith is? Most Christians this week will worship on Sunday. We're here on Saturday, a day early. And we say we're right. Really? Most Christians believe that the Ten Commandments law was done away with when Christ was crucified at Calvary. We say the law is still binding on Christians, don't we? Really? Most Christians believe that, that it is all right to eat any animal or fish or bird. Just cook it good. <laughs> Pray on it. Not us. Not us Adventists. We said, no, 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 no. Some things are clean and some things are not clean. Just, just read the Bible, we say. And we say, we're right. And they say, really? Most Christians believe that when a good person dies, they go straight to heaven. And we say, no, no, and, 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 and they say, so even now, looking down on us, we say, no, no, the dead are dead, and, and don't come up till the resurrection when Jesus comes the second time. And they say, I talked to my mama last night. <laughs> we say, we're right. They say, really? <laughs> Many people in the church, in the world, believe that the world and universe came into existence by a Big Bang Theory. They believe that life on this planet is the result of billions of years of evolution. They, they believe that the, that the ancestors of man are disorganized chemical elements and, and that became cells and became creatures and became fish and became ape-like creatures. And, 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 then, and then over millions of years, we became human. And, 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 and we say, all this happened in one week. Really? We say, give God 
10% of your hard-earned money. And he'll do more with 90% than you can do with 100%. And they say, you're crazy. Is anybody listening to this sermon? We're the knowers of the modern day. The stuff we say does not, if, and listen folks, if God didn't say it, some of the stuff we believe doesn't make any sense at all. But God said it. God said it. Noah, what are you doing? I'm building this boat. It's an ark. It's a what? It's an ark. And you see it's an ark? You know how we get defensive, you know, we you can't see this as an ark? And I'm preparing for a flood. No, no, I don't mean any harm. Could you explain to me what a flood is? It's lots of water coming in. <laughs> lots of what? Lots of water coming in. Well, the water's over there in the sea. What's going to come in? What a, to float this thing is going to come from above and, and, and beneath. That's never happened, Noah. Well, God said it. Are you content? Now, you're smiling. But I'm going to ask you a question. Are you content, my brother, when the best answer you can give is, God said it. Is that enough for you? See, because we like to have explanations and details and facts and figures. And, and Lindsay, sometimes God has no facts, no figures. He just says, I said it. Is that enough to give you peace? Can you stand with your neighbors and friends on God said it? Or do you have to have more? And many times God does not give explanations. How many of you know God doesn't give explanations? <laughs> he's building. He's sawing. And of course, in those first 20 years, he keeps telling them, well, how many, I, I, just you and Mrs. Noah, how come you got so many rooms? What's for my kids? My sons? And they're looking, you know. I remember saying to my track coach, in my young days I was really quite fast, quite fast. Print star, sprinting star. And they wanted me to run on Sabbaths. Well, in my dad's house, you ain't running no track meet on Saturday. If you do, you better really have some fast shoes on. And my dad was a track star. And so I'm saying to my coach, Lindsay, Coach Lindsay, I can't do this. Why? It's the Sabbath. He's looking at me. It, it, it's the Sabbath. What's that got to do with running? Have you been there, folks? Come on now. Have you been there? Well, on the Sabbath, Coach Lindsay, we, we, we give it all to God. Well, God gave you the speed. That's the fastest guy in the county. God gave you the speed. And then, then you know, you mean that Lord doesn't want you to use the gift of running to his glory? So I take this mess home to my dad. <laughs> dad? <laughs> Coach Lindsay said, that God would want me to use my speed to his glory. Now, y'all knew my dad's a very cool dude. Never gets upset. Son, God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then he said, my interpretation of what God said, that you ain't running <laughs> on Sabbath. The members of my track team thought I had lost my mind. You see, folk, and you young folk particularly, you have to come to this point where you own it for yourself. It ain't Coach Lindsay. It ain't Dad. Where do you stand? The 
Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. Let's finish. We know the rest of the story. 120 years preaching. Some of his best help, his granddad Methuselah, his father Lamech, died in the process. And Patriarchs and Prophets Ellen White says there were three classes of people that worked on the ark. Those who worked on the ark, believing and died before the flood came. Second class, those who worked on the ark, believing, and then lost faith. And stopped working. And the third class, those who worked on the ark, never believing, but just wanted to earn the money that Noah was paying. His children grew up working on the ark. Thank God they never left the faith. What do you say? I wonder, folk, when it hit Noah. That nobody was getting on that ark but him, his wife, and his kids. Neighbors not going. Close friends not going. See, my heart reaches out to you. Some of us will leave some family behind. I, I guess what I'm trying to say to you, my brother, you're sitting there maybe with wife and daughters and so forth, and I, 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 wish, I wish with all my heart I'll say that you and Antoinette going together, but, 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 but there is that moment. There, hey, you better listen to your pastor. There is that moment, Sister Dowdy, whether, whether it be you or Lemon or Lemon or you, at some point you got to say, it's me. It's me, oh Lord. And if nobody is saved, I shall be saved. At some point, this thing has got to get personal. I need somebody to talk to me. It's got to get personal. I shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. I shall not be moved. Ain't nobody else coming to prayer meeting. I'm coming. Nobody else returning time. I shall return my time. When did it hit him? Anwar, when did it hit that man preaching on 20 years? Ain't nobody getting on this boat. Nobody I preach to is getting on the boat. It's me. It's my wife. It's my kids. Here's the question. Here's the question, balcony. Is you and Jesus enough? Or do you have to have somebody else to do right? Until your Christian experience reaches that point, Hesky, where you will do right no matter else, what anybody else does, you're not a Christian. You got to reach that point where you say, even if I have to leave my spouse behind. And I can't even imagine that. I've been married to that girl for 49 years. I don't want to go anywhere without her, but God says, Henry, I'm sorry. You got to love me more than father or mother or brother or sister. Noah, if there's nobody on the boat but you. He tests Noah right down to the first drop of rain. Now there was that day when the animals showed up. That was something. Amar, can you picture it? There was a thundering. We'll get dramatic now. There was a thundering on the horizon. Can you see the elephants coming? Can you see them, Orpheal? Can you sing the, see the big hippopotamus coming? Thundering, thundering. Can you see the bird? The sky's black with birds. 
There's a slithering of the grass as the reptiles come and they're being led. Ellen White tells me they were being led, page 98. Page just brought, Adam, animals were being herded by eight angels. God does what you cannot do. Y'all too quiet for me. God does what I can't do. He gives me my part. This God, I can't make a hippopotamus do nothing. I got that, Noah. I got the elephants by the truck. You just keep building the ark. And then the Lord closes the door to the ark and waits seven days. Now, pardon my French. That's a whole lot of manure. I'm sorry. See, I, I, I'm a very realistic preacher. That, this, is, this, is, this, is not, this is not pleasant. The ark has one window, y'all, and the door is closed. I mean, let's just tell this thing like it is. Let's don't try to paint up some picture knowing them singing hymns. Singing hymns, I'm choking to death. These... Lord, would you say, see, here's what the Lord does. Watch me, watch me. The Lord put you, they praying for rain now. Lord, send rain. That's why the Lord's going to take your house and your car. He's going to have you, please come, Jesus. The Volvo's gone. The house is gone. I ain't got nothing. Come on down here with them white robes. Lord, help the preacher. Just when they're at their wit's end. Just when they think they cannot take anything else. Here comes the rain. Hey, here comes the rain. I need my song up there. I need my song up there. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Stand up, let's sing. Anwar, make him sing it. Make him sing it. I don't want no holding back. Sing the words of the song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Here we go. Tis so sweet. Come on, come to on. Trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest. Just to rest upon his promise. Just, Just to Now call his name. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. It was a whole lot to ask of Noah. The test was in the asking. Noah, do you really believe that God would ask you to do something that you couldn't do through his power? The test is in the asking. When he brings you the risk of being a Christian, the test is in the asking. Second verse. Oh, how sweet. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to trust his cleansing blood. Just in simple just faith. Just in simple faith to plunge me. his name. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Perhaps someone is standing here today 
just thought that becoming a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is just too much to ask. I just don't think I can do that, Lord. They're nice people. That that way of life, I just... I invite you today to reconsider that thinking. Perhaps you're a person who once walked in this way and you became convinced that God had asked too much of you. I can't, I can't do it, Lord. Noah's story teaches us God never asks more than you can handle because he gets in there with you and helps you handle it. So two classes of people today, well, three. One, you want to come forward to take your stand. Two, you want to return. Three, you just want to study more, Bible studies. You want to come. Coming for the first time, coming again, you want to study. We're singing the third verse and we're praying that you will come. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and Everybody's head is bowed. I need to wait. Where are you? Been right on the brink. God bless you. You've been right on the brink. Come on, do it today. Move from where you are. Come on down here. Come on down here. Why would you wait another Sabbath when the Spirit of God is tugging at your heart? God bless you. God bless you. Come on. I need to study more, Pastor. Well, you can, you can make your decision today. You can keep on studying. Where are you? Where are you? Just pray, church. Just pray. These are serious moments. This is not about Henry right now. It's about making sure we give the Holy Spirit the time he needs to bring folk to conviction. God bless you, young man. I saw you moving. God bless you. I should have a seat right here. Come on. If you're here, come on. Just just don't make it a big deal. Just, just make this decision day. God is calling you to start building your ark. You don't know how you're going to do it. You just know that God said do it. Close down, Barbara, singing the last verse. Everybody together? I'm so glad. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus said. Jesus.
thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts. Labor yet with that soul that stands on the brink of eternity. Bring them to decision today yet, Lord. Thank you for the precious ones who heard your call and have come. Thank you for the majesty and power of the word. Forgive this poor preacher that he doesn't do a better job, but thank you for trusting me one more time to open the sacred pages and to share them with your people. To this end, we give thanks and praise. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> 